Welcome back to this third and last part of uh, my interview with uh, Yanni Hofmeyer, which is not going to be part of the interview anymore. So we're going to switch gears a little bit this uh, hour and start to speculate about some of the, the rather profound in implications that the work that we've covered in the last two sessions has for all kinds of areas of biology. So just to briefly summarize, in the first part, we went over uh, Rosen's relational biology and his work, uh, his, his approach, his unique approach, his formalism, and his implementation of the four Aristotelian causes. Uh, the sort of definition of, of complexity, Rosenian complexity, as the presence of hierarchical cycles and the closure to efficient causation. And then in the second part of the, our conversation, we went over Yanni's fantastic work of uh, realizing those models or models that are uh, you know, equivalent to, to uh, Rosen's original model, but not quite the same and mapping them onto the, the biochemistry. And very importantly to the uh, milieu of the cell. So not just um, single chemical reactions and their interactions that count, but the maintenance of the overall cellular milieu. And we had concluded last time by saying that this implies that no part of the cell is sort of a universal constructor. It's not deep in the DNA, it's not in the ribosome, as is often claimed, but the cell itself is the, the minimal universal constructor in biology, basically. The minimal um, fabrication and assembly system, as Yanni puts it in his, his formalism. So this obviously has is, is very different from a lot of different takes that have been made on, on these very fundamental problems of biology. So, uh, you know, it touches uh, everything from biochemistry to evolution. And what we want to do in this hour is sort of have a, a, a more relaxed conversation without slides uh, about some of these implications. And the first one, um, those who know me, um, they know that I'm very sort of big on, on sort of the role of dynamics in biology. So the first point I would like to cover with Yanni, um, or, or let's say revisit because we've briefly touched on it already, is uh, these diagrams are just like network diagrams in systems biology, quite static. So we want to quickly revisit the importance of dynamics, and in particular in biochemistry, that is kinetics versus uh, arguments about thermodynamic uh, you know, energy and equilibrium um, in those models. So welcome back, Yanni. Uh, you got coffee, I see, and uh, yes, yes. We're, ready, we're ready to go, right? So, so right. would you like to comment on those aspects, those kinetic aspects a little bit? So that's, I think, a very important point. One, you know, many people, when they look in these diagrams, and, you know, I would be one of them as a systems biologist, you think, oh, it's a, it's a reaction network, and I can model that with differential equations. It's not a reaction network. It is a network that shows a functional organization, which is quite different because the processes are, are different from chemical reactions. I mean, if you think about um, the, the, the functional the functionalization of the mapping F, for instance, if you now recall, this was now, you know, the, say the enzymes. That particular mapping describes a chemical process, uh, it describes an, a, 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 a non covalent process catalyzed by, by, by the intracellular milieu. How you would, if, if you were to, to try and model that as a dynamical system, the best that you can do is to have a concentration of polypeptides as. B in, in my model, that then becomes an enzyme, which would be an enzyme concentration. So you go from a polypeptide concentration to an enzyme concentration. But that is only one variable within the functional description of an enzyme. So actually what, what, that, what that model, uh, what that, that mapping describes is the creation of a rate, of a rate function not only the enzyme concentration inside the rate function, but the whole rate function, which of course, if you model it with dynamical systems, you have to supply the rate function, yeah? But what happens in the cell is there is no rate function until that polypeptide folds and it becomes a rate function. So it's created from basic, from structure. 
So that is the, the so as I always say there's semantics involved there. There's meaning involved, which gets lost if you just you know say I make fun of for a polypeptide concentration to an enzyme concentration, which is fine if you want to, but you lose a lot and you don't really explain what that mapping is all about. So in a sense, that mapping is you cannot really grasp it, capture with a with a differential equation. So that kind of goes back to your image that you gave us last time about uh, this network of, of enzyme kinetics lifting itself out of the background and that's very important i think mark bickhardt has a very beautiful um concept for that it's, it's called dynamic presupposition and it's a hegelian concept it's basically a dialectic concept hegel, hegel was talking about presupposing the presupposition so what does that mean uh, it means that basically the, the, the current state of lifting that network out of the background crucially not only depends on the environmental conditions, but on the history of uh, kinetic reactions that happened before, which gives you a, an account of uh, the historicity and also ultimately of the autonomy of a, a, a certain autonomy of a, an, an organism from its environment. Um, so I think this is extremely important and you don't get that from just looking at uh, you know, the, the whole system in a, in a purely thermodynamic. If you would just apply far from equilibrium thermodynamics, you would not get that historical aspect of the organism. No, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. And, and this idea, I like this idea of presupposition because if you, if you just write down a chemical reaction network, yeah, and you model that, you presuppose that all the side reactions that could possibly influence, you know, influence your model are, are not there. In a sense, what you're doing is you're already presupposing that your model runs at a much faster time scale, part of the time scale, than all the other side reactions. And this is a problem of, with, I think we talked about that before with Ganti, Ganti's model. Mm -hmm. Ganti's mm -hmm. model is purely on the level, it's a, it's a, on the level of, of, of covalent chemistry. So we haven't actually talked about it before because we didn't get around to it last time, but uh, Ganti's chemoton model uh, is a, a model that is, is a network of, of reactions, right, basically. Yeah, maybe, you, I think there's a slide there of, that I gave you. Maybe you share that one because- share that. So while you do that, I think what is nice about the model, which I realized afterwards, is that you can actually use my fabrication assembly model to discuss a few other interesting concepts, such as, for instance, Barberi's ribotype. So mm -hmm. Barberi has this idea that that's not only genotype and, and phenotype, but actually the, the mediator between the two is what he calls the ribotype, which has a different ontological status than the phenotype and the genotype. And actually, my, my model can be used to show that visually very nicely, so, similar to how Patty's split between symbol and function. Again, one can show that very nicely in the model. And, and with uh, here's a picture now of, of, of how my model would capture Ganti's, the three components of Ganti's chemoton. So Ganti's chemoton consists of, of a sort of a metabolism, in which he uses autocatalytic cycles, basically stoichiometric autocatalysis in his cycles. This is the blue, yeah, N, mm -hmm. that's the whole of, of metabolism. And then he has this informational cycle and he has the, the enclosure cycle with the membrane. And so this would be the part of my model that would correspond to, to Ganti's three cycles. But what the model quite clearly shows is what is missing. And what is missing is two things, the enzymes, because again, when you write this down, you presuppose that this happens much quicker than all the other possible parasitic reactions that could happen. So this must be at, a, at, a, at orders of magnitude higher time level of uh, part of the time of the time hierarchy. And so the enzymes are missing and the intracellular milieu is missing. And so without that, Ganti's, I mean, I, I think Ganti's, was brilliant and, and, and you know, thinking of, of this possible organization. And I think it's important because it's clearly there, but he misses that very important part. The most important part according in, to, to my model is how does this whole business become functional? What lifts these reactions out to get, you know, to circumvent this idea of parasitic reactions? 
And for that, you need enzymes. And for enzymes, you need the intracellular milieu to, to keep them functional. Simple as that. Another aspect that's very important is this in informational openness that also has dynamical implications. I didn't realize that actually before talking to you in the last hour uh, about evolutionary openness. So there are other models, hypercycles and autocatalytic networks that are explicitly enzymatic, but they don't have uh, the sort of implementation of uh, the principle of variation that you have in your model, that you're informationally open, that the, the so again, very important to stress that these relational diagrams do not determine a specific physical structure, but a very dynamic uh, and, and always self-constituting, constantly self-constituting system or self-reconstituting system that is in order, it has to, to change in order to stay the same, just like the Red Queen in, in Alice. Um, exactly which has been used as a metaphor for evolution, uh, co-evolution, but could also be used as a metaphor for life itself, that you cannot stay, organization in the sense that we're using it here does not mean a given fixed structure, but it means a certain flow of, of changes uh, of structure, basically, that is all packed into those, those uh, relational diagrams, right? Yeah, so this idea of, the homeostatic maintenance of the intercellular milieu already has a dynamics in it. You know, this is yeah. constantly keeping it there. So that's, you know, there's interesting, you know, we all grew up with Dobzhansky's famous dictum of, you know, nothing in biology makes sense except the light of evolution. But I, but the point is that's only half of the story. That the other half of the story is, you know, what makes, what, what about the cell as, as an entity? And so I've got this mantra of nothing in a cell makes sense except in the light of functional organization. I would add homeostatically maintained functional organization because that is the absolute important bit that, you know, that allows a cell to be a functional entity. And that cannot, that evolution does not explain that. So it's a, it's a separate explanation that you need besides the evolutionary argument. Both, of course, are extremely important and they work together, but you can't only have one side of the coin. You must also explain the other side of the coin. I like that mantra. And again, functional organization is not physical structure. It has nothing. It, it, there's not a, a sort of simple, trivial mapping from one to the other, and it's not a fixed uh, yeah. thing. It's a constant process. And it's, uh, um, you know, we're on a, dialectical systems website here it's a dialectical process in a way because you have also different levels of organization that that sort of constantly uh interact each with each other and and provide yeah. new contexts in which uh uh the the system realizes itself right that's right. what i like about bickhart's idea of dynamical presupposition how does this relate yanni to Stuart kaufman's idea of uh what he calls a kantian whole uh, which is a system that is, has, is close to efficient causation, but has uh, is producing at least one uh, work constraint cycle. So his idea is that you, you put in, it's a system that is able to put in physical work uh, to basically constantly self-constrain, which also relates to Mossio's and Monteville's uh, notion of the closure of constraints. Constraints, yes. Well, I think you know, all of those ideas are extremely important and, 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 and well formulated, and I think they relate perfectly to my model, because for you know, in order to to go through a thermodynamic work cycle, you need to be open to material causation. You need to be thermodynamically open, and so my model allows that. And of course, constraints. So that's interesting because with the Monteville Mosio constraints, you have to think what type of constraints, because you can think of formal causes as constraints, right? And in that sense, the cell is not close to the constraints because you have a freestanding formal cause that sits outside, it can change, yeah? But, it, but you can also think of constraints in terms of parts of efficient causes and there the cell is. So I think one must be, you know, I'm, I must go back to, to what they, how, whether, whether they make the distinction between those two, I can't I don't know whether you remember what they wrote I, there, but you, but it's not close to formal constraints. No, I, I so I would interpret uh, their notion of constraint as, for example, their example is an enzyme, right, or the the, the vascular system that constrains the flow of blood 
and nutrients and, and oxygen. And I think that very much uh, fits in with, a, with a, a, an effective cause, you know, how, uh, which uh, types of reaction get implemented and where do you get oxygen and nutrients in the body? Um, so I, I would, but this is an area where, where some, some further work would be interesting. Yeah. Um, to relate to two, two types of work, I think. Yeah. Because I think this is, this is, again, what my model makes quite clear, is there's a difference between closure to efficient causation and openness to formal causation. Mm -hmm. And both so, of those can be regarded as constraints or sets of constraints. And so it allows you to, to separate the two. So again, it's, these are just all different angles looking at the same problem. So it's like the problem is a sphere and we look at it from different angles. Each illuminates a different part of it, but they all come together. I but think, I think, so too. I think Stu Kaufman's idea is extremely important and it, it captures an important, you know, they, as Rosen says, we have a complex system. There is no largest models, but there are many possible models and they can all work together, but you can never sum all of them to get the, you know, to get the largest model. It's an infinite number. So it's like a sphere and you model them, the sphere with planes, yeah. And each plane is a different model, gives you different perspectives on the, on the sphere. Hold that thought. We're going to come back, definitely going to come back to the, the largest model. Um, and, and, but but and just get, get back to the Kantian whole, because I think Kant and, and Hegel both had very clear thoughts. I think Hegel even, even more clear than Kant about this idea of a system in which everything in the system is there for each other. And in that sense, the cell is a Kantian whole, certainly. So this is a, a very interesting segue into uh, a, another uh, conceptual issue, is, which is uh, located between, you know, uh, within this concept of, of recursivity in, in biological systems and uh, what kind of recursivity these hierarchical cycles actually represent. And I think that's very interesting to discuss in terms of dialectical yeah. systems, because if I may use uh, an example that I, I read in Dennis Walsh's uh, book, Organisms, uh, Agency and Evolution, um, is this comparison between Marx and Churchill. So Churchill said, uh, we built the houses that we work in, and then those houses shape the work we're, we're performing and shape our, our personalities. And, and the argument here is that you can consider the house and the people as existing independent of each other. So the house would still exist if the people wouldn't be working there, the people would still be existing if they wouldn't have the house to work in, but they influence each other. So this is a, a, a metaphor for a, a regulatory type of feedback. While um, the Marxian, which is of course Hegel, not Marx uh, actually, uh, sort of dialectic is a dialectic or, you know, it goes back to Nagarjuna, I think I, I, I heard through Scott Gilbert, this is not something I read up on myself, but it's this dialectic where one of the processes influencing the other wouldn't exist without the other, right? And that uh, goes into the mathematical concept of impredicativity. And I wonder yes. if you could tell us a little more about how really those two uh, kinds of types of recursivity differ from each other. I wouldn't call impredicativity recursive at all. I mean, yeah. mathematically, the idea of a recursive function is one that calls itself until it bottoms out and, for, and fulfills a, a certain criterion. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a constructive thing. You know, you start there and you call itself, call itself, call itself. So that is mostly what is regarded as, as recursive. So many alg algorithms, so it can be captured algorithmically perfectly. It's Turing computable, right? Impredicativity, on the other hand, is exactly as you explained in the Hegelian sense, is that you've got two functions constituting each other and they, they cannot exist separately. The one couldn't be there without the other. And, and that is a, a perfect example of an impredicative system which cannot be modeled algorithmically if one understands exactly what you mean by that. Because this is where this idea, you know, Rosen said that life is not computable. So what he meant by that is it cannot be captured algorithmically in terms of an algorithm that halts eventually. That's very important, that little bit, because it's only in that sense. I mean, Turing compatibility or Turing computability has been extended in various ways as far as my limited understanding of it. And so maybe you can make other arguments, but that is 
if you have to want to understand Louis and Rosen's argument, that is it. it. Cannot be captured by an algorithm that helps. So for me to explain this to 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 my wife is that we want to go to you know we want to go for a walk together, and we stand next to each other, and I can only put my foot forward when she puts her foot forward, and she can only put her foot forward when I put my foot forward. So what happens? It's a perfect description of the system. That's an, it's an algorithmic description of what should happen. But what happens? Absolutely nothing. You're in a deadlock. On the so other it's, hand, it's, it's not even about the halting problem here. It's more about the, the starting problem. You, you never get started in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You never get started. And, you, and, and, this, and, and, and uh, let's say we did get started. And then the algorithm says, I can only stop when she stops. And she can only stop when I stop. stop. And what do we do? We start walk forever. Yeah. You know, so, so that is an impredicative system. It, 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 you can describe it algorithmically, but the algorithm when you implement it doesn't, is in a deadlock, either a, yeah. an infinite loop or it cannot get started. And that's different from recursion. So you know, often when I, when I give a talk on these things and some other mathematician, you know, when I, when I talk about predictive, oh, no, no, that's, ach, that's, just, that's just recursion, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a crucial difference. And in so, that sense, so, this, this functional organization of the cell is also in, the one cannot exist without the other. Enzymes cannot be functional if the intercellular milieu is not there. Intercellular milieu is not there if the enzymes and the transporters are not there to maintain it. You know, they are so linked to each other that you cannot fractionate them. So a recursive system can be fractionated. A predicate system cannot be fractionated. And you get a classical chicken, chicken and egg problem, yes, of course, uh, if you want to get it started. Would you tell us yeah. a little bit more about the history and the formal definition of impredictivity? It comes out of uh, mathematics and, and has to do with set theory. I'm not a mathematician. So, I mean, I've read, I've, I've read a bit about this. And I mean, there's, of course, a long history and many, many books have been written about it. But I, I, I'm not even going to try and venture there now where it comes from originally. But of course, I mean, there, there, there are many people that have talked about it. Um, Wittgenstein, I think, was one of them that, that seriously considered it. You may know of, of quite a number of other people who've talked about this. But I mean, uh, so Bertrand Russell and, and you know, uh, uh, set theory, the origins of set theory is, uh, so of course it came uh, up with Russell's paradox that yeah, sure. The, the, the set of all sets that do not contain itself, uh, themselves and uh, his popularization of that with the barber, the barber uh, of, of this town who shaves all the people who don't shave themselves, does the barber shave himself? Um, yeah. These sort of logical paradoxes um, are, uh, you know, apparently pernicious consequences of, of impredicative uh, definitions, which are definitions that somehow either, either directly or indirectly contain themselves. In the we talked and about that a little bit in the first, remember, in the first exactly. session. So but not it, all, not all imperative or logical paradoxes are, are, are vicious in the yeah. sense of Russell's paradox. Some are benign. I mean, I use this idea of this, you know, the smallest fish of all the fish in the pond, which is a circular definition, definition in terms of itself, but it's quite benign and it, it has a solution. So. So maybe maybe there we, we could say uh, is the type of impredicativity we, we get here really pernicious or not? And um, what I would like to especially talk about with you is this uh, common misunderstanding of Rosen's work as saying you cannot when when Rosen says you cannot have a model a bit a largest model of the organism. It's often interpreted as you cannot simulate the diagram that Rosen presented. Um, which is a, a sort of a, a strong interpretation that I don't read out of Rosen at all. I mean, he, his work does not preclude that you cannot make a, a model of that type of, of, of system, but he says you cannot make a model that captures all the potential and the potential behaviors of that system. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, he, he said quite clearly, you can make many models, many useful models of a system. That tells you a lot and can you can, but there is, but the, for a complex system, there would be an infinite number of such models. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas for a, a mechanistic system, you would have a largest model. You would have pos the possibility of one model that captures the whole behavior. And not just an infinity of models, but they also don't, you know, they don't, you can have an infinite uh, series that some, you know, converge yeah, no, some. They don't yeah. converge to any sort of uh, sum of, of all the models. Uh, no. And that's very important, right? So yeah. to make that a bit more understandable, um, I mean, we're opening a can of worms here, I know that, but uh, it's an interesting can of worms. Um, what you were saying very early on in this discussion now that you, you know, if you use traditional dynamical systems theory with a bunch of equations, uh, some, some initial conditions, some boundary conditions, what you cannot get with that formalism is new, the, the functions themselves, right? F arising exactly. uh, out of the system. But there are functional programming environments. Uh, Lambda calculus is a, a mathematical uh, framework that allows you for such functions to, and now we're coming back to the point before, recursively um, uh, make such functions arise. So there was a famous argument by Giuseppe Longo and, and Matteo Mosio and, and colleagues in 2009 um, that this uh, relates to, to, to Rosen's conjecture. So basically they're saying it is possible to make such models. Um, and I would like you to just very briefly relate that to, to the sort of uh, arguments you made in, in, in our previous discussion about uh, what does that actually say? I mean, for me, so maybe I can get you started. For me, it says that you can really have mathematical models of that, if, if the listeners remember that left-hand part of the, the, the diagram that is, is sort of mechanistic, but only in the sense that goes beyond dynamical systems theory. If you have a, a mechanistic approach to model it that allows you to, to uh, operate on the operators, functional yeah. programming, um, just like yeah. programming languages like Lisp or Haskell or, or stuff like that. Or, yeah. um, but you still can get, uh, for, there's two problems as far, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, so there's two problems here. One of them is that this still doesn't sort of uh, capture the, the possibility that you get uh, new uh, phenomena in the system arising that are not captured by the model. So it's an incompleteness argument. That's one thing. And then the other thing is, of course, the, the physical implementation of the impredicativity, which is sort of treated in that article by Mosio and Long was saying that, you know, of course, we understand that simulating something is not building it. And that's very important here because this sort of problem that you just described, going for a walk with your wife and never getting started, uh, is a huge problem for the physical realization of uh, such systems. So just to, to wrap up this train of thoughts, what you would have to do is you would have to have a functional programming environment that writes its own rules, its own syntax. And the question is whether that is possible or not. And it's possibly not possible because probably not possible because this involves a, a non-formalizable aspect, the semantic aspect. So there's always the semantic aspect of who came up with those syntax rules for the, the programming language itself, right? So that's a whole, whole heap of stuff I'm just throwing at you, go with it. I mean, this is of course something that I've thought about a lot and it's a very interesting yeah. question. Uh, it also goes down to, it comes, a, lot, a lot of it comes down to this idea of, of the use mentioned dichotomy in philosophy. Also, I think Wittgenstein, the late Wittgenstein talked about that. Because we, that's exactly what we have. Just, just as, a, as a practical example, in a sense, the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide, if you write them down, that is the mentioned part of it. You mention it, yeah, you talk about it, but the use part of it is it's only possible when that string of amino acids has folded up and suddenly you have a structure which has an active site which actually binds something and does something to it. Yeah? So that's a very nice biological example of the use mentioned dichotomy. Now, if you, I've, I of course tried to program these things myself. So I use Python. I'm, so it's a very simple language. And you know, I, I said, let us make a, an enzyme in Python. Let's call it something like, a plus B, which is, you know, it's a, it's a function that takes a string, the, the character A, and it concatenates it with B. Um, and so I can write that string. I can have a program that produces the string A plus B, right? 
but that's just mentioning the string. Before that thing becomes functional, that A plus B string, what, happened, what has to happen to it? In Python, what you have to do, first you have to compile it into a functional object, right? That's done by the interpreter. And then of course it has to be executed. So again, it has to be called. So those two functions of, of compiling and executing sit outside your system, it sits in the interpreter. Now I can write a whole lot of beautiful rules that write themselves, yeah? But in the end, in order for the system, for that set of, of to become self produ producing, so the system produces inside all the rules that makes it happen, that, that makes it function. In the end, if you want to close it, you also have to have that system write the interpreter that compiles and functions it. And this is exactly similar or analogous to the intracellular milieu, yeah? So what the cell man managed to do is from the inside, it manages to create the intracellular milieu that allows all the functions you know, to happen. Whereas in my programming language, I can simulate the whole lot except that bit. Mm. That bit yeah. of the, 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 the system of rules writing themselves, it cannot write the interpreter and the interpreter always sits outside. So, so I can you see how far that, I that. can, yeah, yeah. Otherwise how you never get started. Yeah. yeah. How far I can go to simulate it is quite amazing. I can simulate yeah. virtually everything except that bit of the, the internal system writing its own interpreter, writing the interpreter that makes it function. And that is, you see, so that's where the semantics comes in, the meaning. So these mappings, you can, you can do anything you like with them. You can regard them as equational mappings. You can write lambda calculus, whatever. But in the end, you have to realize that when, when one, one writes them down, there's meaning involved. You ask, what does every mapping mean? Not mathematically, if you want to realize it, but biologically. And then, of course, the semantics allows you to do that, but then it becomes difficult to simulate because some of those mappings are not simulable. So that ties in to what you are, were calling functional organization, because when we talk about functions, we always talk about meanings in a certain context, right? Yes. And that's where it becomes completely impossible to formalize uh, a system completely. And that brings us back to the claim that Rosen is sort of the, the girdle of, uh, uh, of biology. Would you like to say something about yeah, that? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because Don Mikulecki, he wrote, I mean, he was a great champion of Rosen and he at some stage wrote uh, a paper with the title of, you know, the, the Rosen with the Newton of biology. I think that is utterly wrong. It's, <laughs> it's ironic, it's actually. Exactly, yeah. exactly the opposite. So I would call Rosen the girdle of biology because, you know, especially with this idea of impredicativity and the importance of semantics. Uh, which comes into it, um, incompleteness. It's all part of Rosen's argument. So, so uh, yeah, I, I, I would certainly go with, with Rosen as the girdle of biology. So once again, <laughs> he's not saying that you cannot... So he uses the term simulation, as we talked about in the first hour, very differently from what we would say. So now we're using the term simulation as a computer simulation. He is not saying you cannot make a computer simulation that mimics the behavior of that diagram that you've made of the, the, the uh, um, efficient closure to efficient causation yeah. in an organism. But he's saying um, this simulation is not able to capture all the potential um, behaviors of that system. And that harks back, I think, to that dynamics argument we did before, because a lot of that is historically contingent, right? It depends on not on, on the context currently of the system, but on its, its, its past. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. So, so it, for me, an interesting example is, you know, again, I, I can only think like a biologist. Mm -hmm. If you claim, for instance, to have a complete model of Escherichia coli, not a simulation, a model of it, right? Then I will challenge you to say, well, can your model do the following, which Escherichia coli can? Namely, you can put a expression, you know, a, a, a plasmid into it with some gene coded in, in you know, some DNA, part of DNA on the plasmid that codes, encodes for a gene. 
If you put that inside the Israshai Kola, what would happen? It would mm-hmm. express that protein. Could be anything. Israshai Kola doesn't know what it is, but in the right environment, in the intracellular milieu, what happens to that polypeptide that is produced? It folds up into a three-dimensional structure, which may or may not have a function. But if it has a function, it is produced and it will function. It, if it catalyzes a new reaction, that's what would happen. Now, your model of the Isherashe Kola, can it do that? Can I give it a new DNA description and ask it, okay, what is, what's going to happen? It may be able to say, well, it's going to be expressed in terms of a polypeptide, but I would ask, yes, and what about the function? Will your model be able to tell me what that particular thing does? In the cell, it just happens by itself. It folds up, and if it has a function, it has a function. If it does something, it does something. But your model will not be able to tell me what the function is. It may be able to say what the three-dimensional structure is. If We haven't solved that yet. The folding problem has not been solved. But let's say it solves the folding problem, and you suddenly have a description of a three-dimensional structure. You still don't know what it does. You don't even know if there's an active site, and if there's an active site, what would bind to it? And yeah. So in that sense, your model is not a largest model because it cannot explain everything that the real system can do. Now it may, may people may say, ah, but that's trivial, you know, you know. But for a largest model, it would it would have to be, produce that function. It, you should know what the rate equation is for that function without without having to go and do an experiment to check what the rate function is. And that's an argument about the limitations of formalization, right? And in that sense, it's also equivalent to Gödel, which was an argument about the limits of formalization, saying that there's always statements that don't fit into the current um, uh, state of the theory, and you can always extend it, but that will be an infinite uh, progress. And in uh, practice, and that's important, again, uh, this does not uh, matter so often. And in fact, you can, after Gödel, people still use number theory yeah, successfully, just like you can still use dynamical systems theory and lambda calculus based models, uh, functional programming models in simulating organisms as much as you want, as long as you're aware that you're going to miss out on those sort of aspects that will always pop up in some way that are not formalizable, that always have something to do with our inability to, to pre-state. Uh, Stuart Kaufman has made this argument that you cannot pre-state all the possible functions of a, a, a thing in, in advance, that you cannot, um, uh, it's the possible functions of a thing are not infinite, they're indefinite. That means that you cannot pre-define or pre-list, pre-state them. And so in this sense, we can say that organisms, that now this is opening another even bigger can of worms. Uh, can we say in this sense, organisms are not, uh, uh, in this sense, they are not algorithmic, because if you cannot uh, predefine a, a space of possibilities, um, you cannot uh, use, uh, algorithms cannot be defined. I mean, you have to, f- to define an algorithm by definition, you have to, it has to be clearly defined in this way. Yeah. And so that gets us into this <laughs> old discussion about organisms and Turing computability and the church Turing theorem. Um, Do we want to talk about that? (laughs) Well, I think we've talked a little bit about it in the sense that um, if you have an empirically hierarchical cycle in your system, then you cannot capture that with an algorithm. To be Turing uh, Turing computable, it means in the classical sense that you have to be able to write down an algorithm that that is implemented by the Turing machine and halts. And halts, yeah. Okay, but even leaving... So if you would leave away the halting condition... Um, and let's say, okay, you can speculate and say, you know everything about an organism since it's evolutionary, since the beginning of life, since the beginning of the universe. Um, could you write an algorithm? And this is completely crazy, of course, and, and not for us limited beings. But I mean, in, in order to actually capture um, the, f- the full potential of the algorithm, uh, of the organism, you would have to, to sort of trace everything back. And even so, you wouldn't be able to, to capture its full potentiality because as you say, there are uh, an infinite maybe number of different models that you could apply to a Rosanian complex system. So depending on the context that you're in, different 
aspects of that system may be important. And it's impossible, according to Stuart Kaufman, to predefine all those different aspects, basically. That's what he's saying. So as long as that condition holds, we can say that uh, organisms will behave in many ways as if they were Turing machines. But in the end, ultimately, they are not, right? So I would say they are aspects, they are models of living systems that, that are Turing, com Turing computable, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can model the whole of intermediate metabolism with dynamical systems beautifully. I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, perfectly computable, no problem. But it's not the whole system. It's just a model of the system that is during computable. And all that Rosen says is that in the end, there is no one model that captures everything that is during computable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, the next question is, of course... So maybe just this point, so you yeah. asked just now, you know, what, what does this give us? I would say that the wonderful thing about this is for, it forces a modicum of modesty on us. Modesty for the claims that we make. Well, my late friend, Paul Celia, was very, you know, he was the professor of, of, of comp philosophy of complex systems and a lifelong friend, and he was very clear that you know if you want to understand one of the implications of, of taking complexity seriously it is you better be a little bit more modest than you are used to being <laughs> and i think for our claims about what we can model about the cell and what we can't model about the cell that holds i was just going to ask is this important in practice but you've already answered this in one way saying that it is in, important in practice in that it determines a certain attitude epistemic humility um, is implied because you know uh, you're much more aware of what you you can't not just what you don't know but what you can't know in advance. Uh, yeah, would you say that? Absolutely. So that's, and so it, it it requires a different sort of view uh, of the world, a different attitude towards uh, complex systems in the Rosen uh, Rosenian sense, which which are organisms, living living organisms, and the systems, of course, that contain them as well. I mean, I would say that applies to e ecosystems, societies, and economies yes. equally well. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's a very big insight that that comes from that. Yeah, uh, a, a complete uh, sort of change in in is required in our collective imaginary. You could call it in the sort of background conditions, which are now, I would say. The, the mechanistic view of the world, let's, let's talk about post-mechanistic biology maybe for a second. So the mechanistic view of the world implicit, also has an implicit metaphysics. It doesn't like metaphysics, but it has an implicit metaphysics. And that is the world is, is, a, a, you know, is knowable, is controllable. And, uh, you know, and that's the aim of science. While this is pretty radical, right? So can I just open uh, this, this, this window and ask you, so what in practice does a sort of a, a, a post-mechanistic biology look like then? And is this, a, so the first question we have to answer for someone working in the lab, I don't know, I hope some of you are watching this. Um, does that, how does that matter? What does that, how does that impact um, the, the working biochemist, the evolutionary biologist and so on? Well, I, I think, I mean, if one understands this and takes this seriously, this question of, of, of the cell as a, as a hierarchical system, yeah, hierarchical, close to efficient causation system, which is then a complex system, it forces on you the whole question of, of what does a complexity view of, of, of the world look like and what does it force you to change from a mechanistic view? And it's... I mean, it's a very, very, very difficult question to answer, but you have to lose a lot of stuff. You must realize that the complex system is not in principle fully controllable or fully understandable. So that if you want to play with it, you have to always expect unex un un you know, unexpected consequences, unintended consequences, um, especially if you do this on a large scale. I mean, for the person in the lab, you do it under very controlled conditions, probably it's not is not that dangerous, but you know, COVID, we're not quite sure where COVID came from. 
but it could be it could be an unintended consequence of something that happened somewhere in the lab. We don't know. It could also, you know, have a natural cause somewhere in bats, as they think. But it could be, in principle, be an unintended consequence. So for the lab person, most of the time it doesn't matter, but it could be in situations where it really does matter. It also, you know, the, the, the the, I mean, the I mean, can I, I before you go on? I mean, this is just the beginning, right? Whether you believe the origin story of the virus is this or that, but the unintended con consequences unfolded after the the, the pandemic broke out, um, yeah. and everybody was uh, surprised. Although these unintended consequences that the virus had were not even hard to predict, they were not <laughs> sort of. But it's really hard for us to to think. Uh, about true complexity and in this sense, which Rosenian complexity, I have to stress again, is very different from this sort of traditional notion of what you could call complicatedness. You know, the, uh, a lot of the heterogeneous ingredients, a lot of nonlinear interactions and complexity theory, defining complexity in this more um, uh, so, sort of vague, it, it's actually more vague because it's a gradual um, um, uh, sort of property of a system while Rosenian complexity, you are either complex or you are not. And it says uh, in a way that, um, you know, these complex systems, which are living systems, of course, that's, that's Rosen's conjecture, is these are uh, actually doing, so these are physical manifestations of non-Turing computable things that, that sort of proves that the physical church Turing um, hypothesis, which says that everything that is computable everything that is physically implementable should be computable is wrong, okay? Yeah. So, um, and I think that is, is, is one of the biggest sort of insights here that, um, as you said, this church Turing, this physical church Turing thesis makes us think that we can uh, predict yes. and control. Yeah. While uh, here we know, and, and I think COVID is even, even far away from our epistemic limitations. Some of the intended consequences were really dumb not to think about. <laughs> to be, I mean, Actually, quite frank, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yes. I, I think that, but sort of what we're talking about here is is a is a scientifically mathematically um, motivated complete switch in our in the end what is some sort of metaphysical view of the world. No, exactly. That's a dangerous so, verse. Yeah. So 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 just for, for in this particular um, topic. Aloysius Lewis recently written in, in Biosystems, a, a paper especially on this Rosen and the, and the Church Turing thesis. Uh, interesting to read that for people who are, you know, want to follow that, that conversation. The other thing is, we'll of put course, a link. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, if you just make a note of that. So the, the, the other thing is, of course, Rosen must be careful. Um, his complex systems are not necessarily living systems. So he says, if everything is close to efficient causation, then you have an organism, mm -hmm. but a complex mm -hmm. system only has somewhere embedded in it, it has to have a hierarchical cycle. Okay, but not yes. all the efficient causes are necessarily inside the hierarchical cycle. But as soon as you have that somewhere, then you have a complex system. So that's his definition of complexity, which is an all or none definition. There's no gradation of you know, more complex or less complex really. So what, what systems apart from living systems did that, does that include? Well, the point is it could, for instance, include a social system. So we're not quite sure. I mean, somebody like Luhmann, of course, has made, made the, 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 the claim that the, the societies are autopoetic, which an, an autopoesis or an autopoetic system is supposed to be close to efficient causation by definition. Um, but who knows? Society may be an example or an economic system maybe an example where there somewhere is an hierarchical system inside it, but not the whole, the whole thing is not close to efficient causation. So I think an ecosystem maybe, I think is the same. So it has aspects of, of a living system and often it contains living systems, but the system as a whole is not necessarily close to efficient causation. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. Gaia, for instance, is close to efficient causation, then in Rosen's definition, it, Gaia would be an organism. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's and an I interesting thought. Yeah, and I don't think it is. I think uh, uh, Lovelock is correct that it has a physiology. Mm -hmm. There, I, I absolutely agree with him. And the whole idea of homeostasis, even, even a, a milieu, but it's not close to efficient causation. So Gaia is not an organism. 
Yeah. I mean, I think they started off, Lovelock and Margulis, Lynn Margulis started off with this claim. Of course, they had huge backlash, especially from Dawkins about that. But in the end, they watered it down a bit and, and they said, no, no, they, they, Lovelock at least said, no, he agrees. It's not an organism. But it certainly has a physiology, which you can understand. Planetary homeostasis was a, yeah. a, a, the concept that uh, he's exactly. still around. Uh, he's very active. Uh, he's, what, he's another one of my heroes. He's a... <laughs> he's the, okay. best, the best scientific autobiography that I've ever read is his homage to Gaia. It's a beautiful book. Okay, I should read that. I haven't actually. Yeah. Um, we got completely sidetracked from, from my original question, which I'm going to pose again to you. How, why, as a sort of a bench biochemist or biologist, as an evolutionary biologist, a practic practicing biologist, why should I care? Yeah, Apart from completely changing my worldview, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's it. You have to think of yourself as an organism. You, think, you start thinking of yourself differently in the first yeah. place. Yeah, this idea, you know, people think many people that I've, I've, I've always used this, you know, this, this, this di dichotomy. What's the difference between a living cell and a, and a car? Because both of them get, you know, the one eats food, the other gets fuel or petrol or whatever. They, they've certainly converted into energy, but what is the difference? And of course, the difference is that the food, yes, part of it becomes energy, but part of it, most of it becomes you. Yeah. Whereas with a car, so the point is, if you break down, you repair yourself. But if the car breaks down, then of course you have to get somebody from outside. So it's this, it's this being able to maintain and produce and fabricate or manufacture yourself, which is, and it, it's amazing when you when you really accept that, how it makes you think differently about the world and yourself. So in a sense, it's a it is a changing your worldview. But we could also say that these aspects of biochemist, bi biochemical networks, biochemical systems have not been empirically investigated. Of course, it's hard to do this, but um, would you say that, that by making it concrete, um, we, we could now go and, and, and look at these, we, we could set up a research program that actually takes uh, this model that you put out. I guess the, the aim of that model, uh, of the biochemical model, uh, is, is to inspire also experimentalists to, to go after and, and test it. So how would you envisit, uh, envision this uh, sort of research program? So the ultimate research program, which I don't think I would uh, want to be part of or agree with, is knowing now what makes us, or if you accept my, my model, and that is that what makes a cell alive, now the question is, can you make it? Can you synthesize a cell? So that, you know, synthetic biology is, of course, a, is a big field today. But in all the attempts up to now, it's never a de novo from scratch business. You always start with a living thing. You know, the, the, the Craig Venter, um, beautiful experiments, but of course they started with an intact intracellular milieu. Huh? I mean, and just to, to they, they, what they did is they completely synthesized a, a genome and put it in an existing bacterial yeah. cell. And then they said they created life, right? Yeah. Which they of course didn't get started off with life and manipulated it beautifully, you know, fantastic experiment and technically very, very, very sophisticated. <laughs> but they didn't create life. And so the snag is, can we, if now that we know what, if you accept my model, if we know, you know, what it's about, can we make it uh, so, so from scratch? Venture is like the reprap of, of biology. And, you know, and, and so how can we put our focus on, so this, this, the missing factor, the, 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 the milieu, right? I mean, and the chicken and egg problem that is, is related to it, it make it really difficult to mechanistically in, investigate it. And we just made the argument that it cannot be captured by mechanistic models entirely. So um, what you're saying is, this is a challenge for synthetic biology, basically, in the end. Um, and because of this uh, problem of, of realization in the physical sense that we were talking about before, are, what do you think about the thought that in order to, to sort of uh, empirically study that, you would have to build cells? That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Not, not just computer simulations, but you have to go and nope. make those cells. If, I, if I had to now prove, you know, whether my model is correct, 
The mm-hmm. only way that I could do it is by building it from scratch. Right. So thinking you maybe you start you start with a, a vesicle, yeah. That that that's the first thing you probably have to do is to separate the inside from the outside. So let's say you have a membrane vesicle. Then you have to first the first thing probably to do is to make sure that you have an intercellular milieu that is correct. So you have to mm-hmm. isolate from so you have to start building stuff into that. So at least you must have the membrane transporters that that regulate the electrolyte composition. Then you have to start introducing stuff inside, you know, that make that start making the, those electrolyte transporters as well. Mm-hmm. And then, so you have to start building this manufacturing system inside that environment that you've created. I don't know whether it's possible. Or, as I said, I personally don't want to be part of that. I think it's a very bad idea that we start synthesizing. We are already manipulating life at a level where I don't think we should. So, uh, so un- unintended consequences. Absolutely. Let's just- Let's just leave it at that. I mean, this is yeah. absolutely massive. And I think I totally agree with you that the, the manipulation and, and release of uh, manipulated organisms in the environment um, based on a reductionist uh, 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 paradigm says, okay, we, we, we know what's going to, you know, if we, if we eradicate mosquitoes with a gene drive, we know what's going to happen. They're going to die out. Uh, and that's it. And, and you have no idea about what kind of ecological unintended. Exactly. It's always this. I mean, so also with GMOs. No. Yeah. I mean, I would have no problem eating a GMO tomato because, of course, I know as a biochemist, there's nothing there in there that's going to do anything else. But if you know, that's that's not the unintended consequence that we're worried about. The unintended consequence we're worried about is what happens to the diversity, for instance. Yeah. And what happens in the ecosystem? And so, so as you said just now, so it's much wider than that. People tend to focus on, and scientists are also often skirt around these issues and make claims, you know, oh, the GMOs are not dangerous. Yeah, they're not dangerous to eat maybe, but they may be hugely dangerous when you stick them into the environment. So there's a certain irony, I would say, in that the, the empirical research program that required to test your model um, violates your um, philosophical paradigm, you know, the sort of philosophy it inspires. So, yes. so um, maybe as a sort of, we have a keep, uh, to keep an eye on the time, but uh, maybe it's a sort of a finishing word, but do you see any way out of this dilemma for a post-mechanistic biology? What, what can we do to be ethical uh, about this while uh, still, I mean, this is stuff I want empirically investigated in the end, because it's not going to be taken serious otherwise by a lot of the people who should, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a typical conundrum. <laughs> so Rosen had the same. As Rosen said, he knows he, he knows what to do to create a, to create life from you know just from molecules, but he's not going to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> because great. he doesn't think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so this is that, that's both. Reason. That's both. I agree. Both. I agree with that. But it's also a little cheap, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he didn't. I mean, so I don't agree with him. I don't think he knew how to do it because yeah. his model okay. is if, if he, it's based on his MR replicative MR model. I'm sorry, but you can't do that. But on my model, yes, I know exactly what to do and whether I can do it and whether it's possible. That's that's different question because you know you have this problem it's impredicative so how to get it started exactly it's not a recursive thing you know so but it it may be possible to get it kick-started but what is quite important i think is and and this is a huge thing is the, uh, the origin of life because so the three basic questions of biology is what is life how did it start and how did it evolve yeah so we spent a hell of a lot of time on the how did it evolve. Very little on what is life, but now I think we have a, a model that is sort of a good starting point. Um, and then, but the how, how did it originate? So at the moment, of course, there are huge arguments around whether it's the RNA world on the one hand, or whether it is a first you know, catalytic metabolic world, or whether it's an autocatalytic set world. Mm-hmm. You know, the Hordeik, Steele, Kaufman ideas, which I think are very good ideas. And I, I would go, if, you, if I had to choose any of them, I would go with the autocatalytic set. Mm-hmm. But this post-mechanistic biology that you're talking about would 
post, it would, would post a huge challenge to autocatalytic sets. How do you get from that organization to the functional organization that I have in my cell, where there is a code and where there is no autocatalytic set? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, I mean, or they- Necessarily, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they've got a paper where they claim that in the, in, in the, in the, they found autocatalytic sets in, in the metabolism part of, 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 of E. coli. The point is, does, if, maybe there is one, but th that's not necessary. Nothing in my model depends on there being an autocatalytic set within, uh, within the metabol into the covalent chemistry part, the metabolism part. Of, right, right, of, right. Of, yeah. But the whole system, in a sense, is autocatalytic, but, but, with this added uh, non-localizable variable that in it. Yeah, right? exactly. There's one so, in there, which is a general non-specific catalyst, which, yeah. I think in this sense, you agree with uh, Matteo Mosio and, and, and co-workers, uh, uh, Alvaro Moreno and, and, and those people saying that, that hier hierarchical, some sort of hierarchical relationship is, is crucial and, and catalytic sets just don't do have that, basically. Yeah. Um, it so may are, very well be, but the point yeah. is at the moment the claim is made, oh, once you have an autocatalytic catalytic set, then everything else will just happen. No way. So that it may be a necessary ingredient, but not a sufficient condition for, for a living. It could person. be a way that it started off, but you still have to explain how we get from there to what we have in a modern cell, which is okay. yeah. vastly different. So that's a neglected and, and hugely important step. How do you get the origination of function? Uh, in biology from that yeah right functional entailment yeah. again coming back to that very very important concept that we started off with and that is something uh that is a, a radically different perspective on living systems that a lot of biologists have today um we're not saying that this should replace again we're not saying this should replace all the existing investigations we saw that even in yanni's model there is a large part of the organism that can be tackled using traditional dynamical systems, other okay. mechanistic approaches. But we're saying, here's another perspective that will help us tackle a, a number of questions that have just simply been not, not a, it's not that they haven't been answered. It's basically that they haven't been asked in a long time in, in, in biology. And I think that's, that's already a, a, a validation of the approach in itself. Yanni, we're out of time, but I think we've covered, I mean, especially in this last hour, you know, everything uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the vast reaches, we've given people a, a, an impression of the vast reaches of, of the consequences of, of this way. And I, I really love what you said. Well, the first practical consequence is that you see the world uh, in a completely different way. And I would like to leave it at that. And, and I yeah. certainly, from studying this, this is one thing it has given me, this different perspective on the world. And, and you've been a great influence there on me. So thank you again for joining this conversation here. Uh, and it's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to, to what's coming forth uh, from your corner of the world in the future. Thanks well, so much for- It's been a, an honor to talk to you, Yogi. Um, it is a huge joy. And, and maybe we can learn a lesson from the cell, no matter where we come from, somewhere there is a lesson, I think, to be learned. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Keep well.